expertise because now we have uh, a very good specialist, a specialist, a doctor in physical medicine and rehabilitation and a, a, a wonderful physiotherapist from India. So let me introduce you, my good fr uh, fellows who are here, and then I'm gonna, we can start and I'm gonna tell you guys how we will conduct this uh, webinar in a very specific and logical way. So from India, uh, I have here, we have here, my good friend, Dr. Devayane Takre. She is an, uh, a lovely physiotherapist from the city of Nagpur. I met her, uh, I, I never met her in person, at least still, but we had a patient together that I operated in India three years ago, very difficult case. She did the rehabilitation and we became closer and now we are uh, not only colleagues, but friends. And uh, I invited her because she has a lovely experience with breast cancer and frozen shoulder, which is something not common, at least to my practice. And she will enlighten us with uh, a lot of uh, good ideas about that. From Spain, now Europe is finally on the, on the scenario. Uh, here, my good new friend, Dr. Juan Miguens. Dr. Juan is a lovely uh, uh, specialist on rehabilitation medicine, on physical medicine. He's a physiat physiatrist, and he has a lot of experience, not only in the field, but with ultrasound from a diagnostic point of view and from management point of view. And he will give us a lot of ideas about this. And uh, still we have here my old friend, we are friends for a lot of time, the famous Dr. Daniel Moya. For uh, those who still don't uh, know Dr. Daniel, he lives in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he was the president of last year, International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, uh, a very, I would say, dedicated educator. And he is here with us on the second time. And I must tell him that this is the second, but not the last, because he will be invited many others. And I am sure that he will give us and give me the honor to continue this educational journey. So I just want you guys to, to do a short in, introduction and then, I'm, and then I'm gonna tell you how we will do it in a very logical way and then Dr. Daniel can start. So Devayani, ladies first, just say hello to everybody, please. Hello, namaste. I'm Dr. Devayani Thakre and it's a pleasure to be in this uh, platform with all the people around the globe. Excellent knowledge sharing. I will, I'm loving this, I'm loving this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Dr. Juan, el microfono es tuyo. You can say whatever you want, please. Thank you very much. I am very grateful for your kindness invitation to share with all of you this fifth webinar. And um, I appreciate um, your kindness uh, so much. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So let's see the president now, please, da Daniel. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you for your words. I think we have a very challenging uh, topic and a yeah. great team, so we will have a very nice time here. Yeah. Okay. So just for everybody to understand, uh, we have, all the four of us, we have discussed things to make things very, uh, uh, very crispy here. So this is what we will do. Uh, we will start with the, the, uh, the definition of the problem because it's a clinical entity. So as a clinical entity, it has a definition, it has a, physio, a physiopathological explanation. Then we will uh, make you guys understand uh, how can we uh, classify the problem in a very easy to understand way to clinical practice. And then we will come to diagnosis. We will talk about the clinical diagnosis. Dr. Daniel will enlighten us with MRI ideas and Dr. Juan from Spain with ultrasound ideas in terms of diagnosis. And after that, we will go to management. We will share you our experience managing these cases. I've been doing this for 15 years, Dr. Daniel, much more, and we have a lot of experience here. We will give a lot of attention to suprascapular nerve blocks, uh, Dr. Devayani, uh, 
uh, in the second half will uh, show us her experience in breast cancer. And in the end, I'm going to show you how to do the surgical management of this condition, which is a super exception, but it exists. And my video is very pedagogical, okay? So it's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, and Dr. Daniel, you can start, please. Share your screen and you can start. Okay, thank you very much. As tango dancers used to say, I will dance with the ugliest girl because yeah. definitions is a problem here. Yeah. It is really controversial. Yeah. And we will try to, to have a consensus. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we all will agree in that we are facing a condition in which the main problem is a significant restriction of shoulder motion both active and passive, and that is a very important point. Generally, we see this in people around 40 to 60 years old, uh, in the middle age of life. It is a little more frequent in females, and in 20 to 30% is bilateral. I could say that so far, we all will agree about this, but uh, now the controversies begin because uh, it is considered to be a self-limited condition, but there are some papers that have follow up patients for four years, and they have seen that around 40% of the patients have persistent symptoms after four years. So even it is lived to its natural evolution, uh, in 40% of the cases, problems will continue with time. We also will agree that there are mainly three phases. Some authors speak about four phases, but the main ones are the freezing phase uh, in which the range of motion is going down and the pain is going up. The frozen stage in which the limitation of the range of motion is very important and uh, the pain is also important and finally the throwing um, phase in which very slowly the motion is recovered and the pain is going down if we consider the incidence of this pathology ha some authors have been have gone very far and says and said that it could be fine uh, it could be fine in up to 80 8% of men and 10% of women. But uh, other authors like Bonker said that in, in fact, it is around 1% of the general population and that the term frozen shoulder is over, overused and misused. So now we begin speaking about the controversies with the terms and the labels that are used, are used to define these uh, patients. In fact, everything began with the name humerus scapular periarthritis. Uh, adhesive capsulitis is a very popular term as well. Frozen shoulder, idiopathic frozen shoulder, contracture of the shoulder, and stiff shoulder, just to tell you some of them, because there are more. So it is very difficult to speak the same language when we have so many different names. And why? Well, in fact, the first to describe this condition was Duplay in France in 1872. And he coined a very popular name for around the century. It, it was a marketing success. But you know, the, this term has disappear from our everyday language in medicine. And as you see in the last 20 years, there were not many, just two papers speaking about uh, the, the humor scapular periarthritis. When I was a resident, it was still popular in my country and especially rheumatologists used to keep on using it. What not too many people know is that, in fact, this description was based in 
one shoulder. It, it was a patient that um, Dr. Duplay met when the patient was alive. And this patient had a pain and limited uh, range of motion on one shoulder. The other shoulder was normal. And when this patient died, Duplay performed the autopsy of the patient and he saw a very hypertrophic and retracted subacromial bursa. So, and compare it to the contralateral shoulder and decide that the reason for shoulder pain was the subacromial bursa and the tissue that was around the joint. So here we have, besides the method uh, and just the description based in one case, uh, that there is a pathological confusion because in fact, we know that what is affected in these cases is the capsule, not the tissue that is around the capsule. Uh, so now this, uh, term is not used at all. In 1934, who is considered the father of shoulder surgery, Codman, defined what he named frozen shoulder. And he was very honest. He said, it is a condition difficult to define, difficult to explain, and difficult to treat. And almost 100 years later, we could say the same. <laughs> But, you know, uh, there are some detractors of this uh, definition. In, when uh, there were 50 years after the, the book of Codman was published, Bunker published a paper saying that it was time to have a new name for frozen shoulder. He did not agree with that. And he said that nothing is frozen, uh, just the contrary. There is an inflammation. There is a higher temperature in the shoulder. And for the 75 years anniversary, he published another paper. And he went back to the same topic saying, it is time for a new name. But in 2014, Bunker itself published a paper, a very interesting paper about the physiopathology of this condition that we will go back to this paper, but he put in the title frozen shoulder. So it seems that he gave up and he accepted to name frozen shoulder as frozen shoulder. In 1945, Neweiser published a very important paper and he used for the first time the term adhesive capsulitis. And this term also became very popular, but uh, it does not reflect the pathological process because there are not additions in, uh, they are not found additions in, uh, in the patient's shoulder with frozen shoulder. Anyways, both terms are very popular. If we check in PubMed, you will see that uh, they are not only popular, they are used very frequently in the last year, in the last years. Another, Landmark was the paper by Zuckerman in 2011, and he divided frozen shoulder in two categories, primary frozen shoulder or idiopathic frozen shoulder that has a known uh, origin and secondary frozen shoulder. And he went even, even far and he divided the secondary frozen shoulder in three categories, intrinsic, related to rotator cuff tears, bicep tendinopathies, and calcific tendinopathies, extrinsic, and uh, it was already mentioned, and we will go back to this point, the previous breast surgery, previous cerebrovascular accident, cervical radiculopathy, chest wall tumors, humeral clavicular fractures, scapulothoracic abnormalities, and acromioclavicular osteoarthritis. And finally, the systemic ones, the related especially with diabetes and with thyroid pathology. What we should not forget is that there is another factor to be considered. And that, those are the psychological problems and the stress and psychiatric problems. It has been considered that the shoulder after the spine is the second target where, where we project our conflicts. And this paper is very interesting. 
uh, they show that almost 30% of patients suffering frozen shoulder have a high risk of depression. And we could discuss if the depression was before or after the frozen shoulder. And almost 25% have high risk of anxiety. And those patients with anxiety or depression and or depression, uh, they have most, uh, more important uh, symptoms. The, the, the limitation of the range of motion is bigger and the pain is bigger. We must also uh, remember the definition of kinesiophobia that could participate in, in this condition and is defined as an irrational uh, fear, uh, fear uh, of physical movement and activity. And this is in general result of a history of trauma, but not always. In 2016, Itoi and collaborators proposed another definition and they, they changed the name to stiff shoulder and they consider frozen shoulder as the primary idiopathic and secondary stiff shoulder all other causes. I feel that these proposals uh, put more confusion in the terms. And all of us will feel that we can propose another classification, but it seems to me that we should agree in what is classical and work on that. Anyways, the, the name Steve Shoulder is growing in the use as we can see in PubMed. And the important point is if these names are accepted or not by orthopedic surgeons, by physiotherapists, by physiatric um, doctors. And uh, Dr. Zuckerman in 2011 conducted a survey amongst the members of the um, American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Society. 190 members participate and 80% said that they agree with the definition of primary shoulder, uh, frozen shoulder, and 85% agree in the division between primary and secondary types. And that is important. It is important, but it is not well accepted all over the world because in 2018, the Japanese Shoulder Society, the oldest shoulder society in the world, um, conduct uh, the, a similar um, survey. And the conclusion was there were lower rates of agreement among the Japanese Shoulder Society members than the American Shoulder Society members with these kind of definitions. So I am not very optimistic about having a consensus because there are many different etiologies. Uh, there are many different societies every day. There are new societies, international societies, uh, continental societies, national societies looking for having their own consensus. And there are also many medical specialties and allied health professionals involved in the treatment of these conditions. So what we propose is to speak about frozen shoulder, to have a distinction between primary or idiopathic and secondary frozen shoulder, and to try to get to all the allied health professionals and all the, the different specialities in medicine involved in the treatment of these cases to have a consensus. Uh, it is not going to be easy uh, because we have professionals like this one treating patients, you can see here, a patient before with a limited range of motion, as you can see, pain. Um, uh, this professional is using some kind of very subtle manipulation, as you can see. And then, of course, it's not enough with that. He will use technology. And now you can see the use of technology to treat I don't know if this guy says frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis or whatever. And 
this is the results that this man offers. So <laughs> uh, as you see, there are many, many controversial things from the definition to the treatment. Okay, uh, Daniel, see, uh, that was a very nice introduction, but it's, it's important for us. I'm laughing because of this management because it's really super technological, but I think that the audience should not really get very excited with this methodology. <laughs> but in, in spite of that, see, that was imp important for all of us to un understand that uh, literature is very confusing but we are talking about the same clinical entity. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that besides the beautiful historical perspective that you have shown, one landmark was the understanding of Zuckerman, which I use every day, that you have a primary uh, presentation, which we call a primary frozen shoulder, but many call a primary adhesive capsulitis. And on the other hand, we have a secondary in which we have a cause. And I just want to highlight that uh, not only the secondary frozen <clears throat> shoulder is much more common than the primary frozen shoulder, but I really would like people to understand that besides all of the things in Zuckerman's uh, understanding, we must understand, and I want you, Daniel, to comment upon it, but you will agree with me, I'm, I, I, am, I, I think, I'm quite sure, that the, uh, when we think about the secondary, okay, uh, the post-operative scenario, the post-operative, the post-operative frozen shoulder is a very common thing and it's responsible for the vast majority of the cases that I, Dr. Sergio, have been seeing for, uh, for the last 15 years or even more. So whenever you, you do a proximal humerus uh, fracture and you develop stiffness, this is a secondary frozen shoulder. You know that the venohumeral joint is absolutely okay. you see in the X, raise uh, and, you, and you examine the patient and how many secondary frozen shoulders do I have in my rotator cuff arthroscopies? Well, it's an exception, thanks God, but it, it really helps. And it's not difficult to me to do such diagnosis or it's much easier when I have a secondary frozen shoulder, especially when it happens, and it happens after a, a surgical procedure, okay? It's much more difficult to, to do the diagnosis on a primary case because it, uh, in, the, in the first phase of the tree phase, it, it, it mimics, it resembles uh, a lot of rotator cuff pain. So uh, this is something that I, I really think it's, uh, it's important. And besides that, we have to think about establishing the diagnosis because in the end, independently of the nomenclature, we are talking about the same problem, okay? Which is a problem, a condition from, we still don't, the, the physiopathology, you know, is still poorly understood. It's not wonderfully understood, but in spite of that, it's a condition of, uh, still uh, uh, some uncertainty from a pathophysiological point of view, but is characterized by, st uh, by adhesions or retractions in the glenohumeral capsule, limiting ad uh, passive and active motion in the absence of other diseases. So the rotator cuff is fine, the glenohumeral joint is fine, the problem is in the capsule. And from a diagnostic point of view, we must have a very good medical history because the medical history plays a lot of uh, importance. Well, in everything in medicine, in gynecology and, and orthopedics, but it's very important. Only with the clinical history, we can figure out a lot of things. You have been doing this for so many years and all of us. And the physical examination is very important. Uh, because the physical examination is a key point in the diagnosis. So having said that, 
Do you want to make any comments and especially on the physical examination? Uh, if you want, I have a very short presentation about physiopathology that you yes. already mentioned, and then we yeah. can move to, to the um, diagnosis, okay? Yes, yes, please. Good. Just a second. As you said, uh, we do not know uh, in deep what is going on with the physiopathology. It, yes. it is really understood, but there are some points that are really known and they are a good base to progress in the future, uh, knowing more about this. And in fact, we could say that it begins like an immune response and this immune response leads to an inflammation, then a phase of fibrosis. And finally, if we have, we are lucky enough to have a self-limited situation, we have the resolution. Uh, what triggers the immune response is something that we do not know. Again, I go back to some uh, psychological problems in some patients. Although I have already told you, I always remember a patient uh, who uh, was noticed that her daughter was pregnant and she was single. And in two days, she developed a frozen shoulder. So uh, sometimes it's very clear a, this post-stress reaction and the developing of the frozen shoulder. There is a very interesting theory by Bunker uh, that I already mentioned. At that time, the bacteria was named Propionibacterium. Now we speak about Cutibacterium. But he found in 10 patients with frozen shoulder that eight of them had positive findings on extent cultures uh, with the presence of bacteria in the capsule. And six of the 10 cases were Propioni or Cutibacterium agnes located there. So he postulated that perhaps uh, the Cutibacterium agnes was the helicobacter of the frozen shoulder. But after that, some papers appear uh, notifying that they, or reporting that they found uh, the presence of Cutibacterium in the capsule of patients that were operated for the first time for, uh, because of a glenohumeral instability. And the cultures uh, show that Cutibacterium could live in our joint capsules without giving any kind of symptoms. So uh, this is a controversial point of view, but could make sense. Again, we speak about different phases. The initial stage uh, have synovial inflammatory reaction and very uh, slow increasing of pain. The freezing stage uh, have a very important synovitis, uh, uh, synovitis and uh, it is defined as the Christmas tree synovitis. And the stiffness is uh, getting worse in these patients. Then we have the frozen stage with mining, minimal synovitis and stiffness, stiffness. And finally, the towing stage with full, fully mature additions and a profound, profound stiffness. It is important to consider that the structures that go through all this process are especially the rotator interval, the anterior capsule, and the inferior ligament, glenohumeral ligament complex. So the posterior capsule is generally not affected in these patients. Uh, there are many uh, factors included in uh, the biochemical and biological reaction. And we know now that cytokines and growth factors especially um, those growth factors like uh, transforming growth factor beta and uh, platelet uh, growth factor and vascular growth factors are involved 
in this process. Uh, there are also matrix components and myofibroblasts have a key uh, importance in uh, the contractile scar tissue. Um, also, um, metalloproteinase like um, and are part of the, degra the degradation and natural turnover of the connective tissue and the inhibitor of metalloproteases uh, also have here a, a, a role. So uh, knowing that there is a first phase in which inflammation mediators have a lot to do with this condition, some authors have proposed that the use of corticoid in uh, initial phase could be important. There also we have spoken about immune factors. Uh, there are neuronal and vascular factors, and there are process of neo-innervation and neoangiogenesis of the capsule that have been described. So in summary, we have an inflammation, uh, an inflammatory healing response that it is triggered because of a uh, situation that we do not know. Um, these produce an accumulation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts that uh, in, fa in fact with the failure of the collagen remodeling leads to the frozen shoulder. Very, very uh, brief summary of the main uh, topics related to uh, the frozen shoulder. Yeah, but I want to make some comments, which is uh, very useful for the audience, because you see, we are super specialists. Uh, I am a shoulder and elbow guy. You two, uh, the other presenters have a, a, a very good, uh, a very good uh, experience, but we have many general orthopedic surgeons here, especially juniors from India. So I just want to make some specific points, highlights. Uh, the first thing is, in spite of the gaps from the physiopathological point of view, we can treat the problem and results, if you know how to manage, they are good. This is a message that I really want to show because it may sound a cliche or with some redundance, but it's not. We can manage that and results, they can be very good. And I've been doing this for so long time and so Dr. Daniel. The other thing that I want to make people understand is that it's an inflammatory disease. In spite of the gaps of the physiopathological aspect, it's an inflammatory disease which leads to an overproduction of uh, uh, an, an overaction of fibroblasts and many fibrotic tissue. We have a difficulty to remodel. And this is why uh, we have the, the stiffness and uh, ultimately, and ultimately, surgery is a super exception. But when you, uh, after one year, you enter with the arthroscope, you see a very thick wall in the rotator interval, and removing it is what the surgery is is about. But it's a super exception. But and just one more comment: in spite of all of the structures that Dr. Daniel has beautifully shown. There is just one more which is involved, which is the coracohumeral ligament, the coracohumeral ligament, which in practice, it doesn't change anything. But it's, again, surgery is a super exception, but it's important to address it when you are doing these things too. Uh, but we can manage that. And in spite of all of these gaps, I think that we should now discuss the diagnosis. Uh, so the diagnosis is, is well, it's, everything starts with clinics, but you see, when you have a post-operative scenario, it's much easier and uh, is different from, excuse me? Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's different, it's different uh, from an idiopathic uh, scenario. But one thing that I just wanna uh, ask Dr. Daniel, be, because it's super important, I, I just want to know if you will uh, talk about it in your presentation. If not, we can discuss it, which is many times people, uh, you, you, what we have in front of us is a pain inhibited motion shoulder. 
So a shoulder with pain, but it's not an adhesive capsulitis or a frozen shoulder. This is what Zuckerman calls a pain inhibited motion scenario. It happens a lot on, uh, I would say on, uh, well, I, I, in, uh, inflammations of the subacromial bursa. It happens a lot when you pick up a woman with calcific tendonitis. And in these cases, uh, the, the subacromial anesthetic test plays a big role in understanding not only where is the pain from, but in understanding if we are talking about a frozen shoulder or just a pain inhibited motion scenario. Uh, will you address this uh, in your presentation, Daniel, or we can just talk about it? No, we, we, we can talk. I agree with you. Sometimes the, the border between one condition and the other is very little. It's very subtle, uh, yeah. you know, and it is very difficult because uh, if I have a calcification of the rotator cuff, uh, I could say that it is a limited limitation of the range of motion because pain, but pain, 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 I have pain. seen frozen shoulders as a complication of acute reabsorption of the calcification. So uh, both conditions, the limitation by pain and the real frozen shoulders sometimes are very close so one thing that I really want audience to understand, it took me a lot of time, years and years to understand this, but I really want the audience to understand is that what, what Dr. Daniel is saying is that many times a subacromial problem can evolve as a complication to a secondary frozen shoulder, mm -hmm. but many times not. And how do you do the differentiation in terms of uh, from diagnostic? You can do a 10 cc or 8 cc xylocaine test in the subacromial area. Many times I, I learned that with uh, Zuckerman and it makes a big difference. In, in, it has already saved me many times. So many times what we are seeing is a pain inhibited motion because of a subacromial problem that still, at least still, has not evolved as a complication to a secondary frozen shoulder. And I see this a lot in the office. And how do you do the differentiation with a subacromial anesthetic test? So if you have, I would say calcifications uh, in the, uh, from uh, calcific tendonitis, they are uh, in the reabsorption area, the patient is with a lot of pain. If you do a, a subacromial anesthetic test, after five minutes, the pain is gone. And no, oh, doctor, I am absolutely fine. That was never a frozen shoulder. That was a pain inhibited motion scenario. And if you do that, and I'm talking to the audience now, the pain is gone. The pain is absolutely gone. But you examine her and she has painless limitation of the glenohumeral motion. Then you can infer from a diagnostic point of view that that is a secondary frozen shoulder. I think that this is very important to highlight because many times with the knowledge of the clinical behavior and with an anesthetic test, you can have lovely diagnosis in front of you. I have been doing this for many years. It helps me a lot. So, and it's a, such a, an easy tool because MRI is super, super useful. We will learn ultrasound now, but with your knowledge and with 10 cc of xylocaine that can help you a lot in understanding if it's just a pain in, in inhibited motion scenario or if you're talking or uh, about a secondary frozen shoulder uh do you want to make any compliments about this daniel i am being very harsh on this because i think this is very important no 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 uh, i agree with you uh, i think you mentioned before uh what I think is very important, not only to diagnose uh, frozen shoulder, but to every patient we, we meet, to have a general idea about the medical history. Uh, I used to receive many patients uh, with diabetes, uh, frozen shoulder because of diabetes. So I have had discussions, send the patients, for instance, to the uh, 
endocrinologists and the endocrinologists say used to say some in some cases there is no relation between shoulder and hormones you know so sometimes we need to to be uh, a little bit active to rule out because the point here is not only sometimes it's easier to give a positive diagnosis of a condition. It is more difficult to rule out other pathologies. And here yeah. we have a lot yeah. of work to do in a frozen shoulder because we need to make us sure that there is nothing else going around. Yes, and in this aspect, the MRI plays a super important role. Yeah, and this is what I guess you will talk about. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just to say that it is very important to make a very uh, deep evaluation of the range of motion, always to write down in the chart the uh, result, because we will see the patient for many months. And it is very important for us to record the, the values and to check and show the patient because sometimes is a little bit frustrating for the patient but when yes. yes yes when you show them that there is a real difference that it was measured uh, they realize and what i see is sometimes you get uh, for instance the second appointment the patient has improved the forward flexion, but not the external rotation. And then you advance with external rotation. So it is very important to have a documentation of the range of motion and put everything in the chart. I, I generally check a forward flexion, external rotation, and internal rotation, as you can see on the right uh, in the book by Madsen uh, using the level that the thumb gets in the spine. It is mandatory to have x-rays because by definition, frozen shoulder is a situation in which x-rays are normal. And it is very important to use x-rays to rule out calcifications of rotator cuff because MRI uh, sometimes will not show clearly calcifications. And the MRI, uh, it's not initially indicated, and, but it is important to rule out a possible rotator cuff tear or intraarticular pathology. So uh, th that, that is the application. We do not need MRI to diagnose uh, a frozen shoulder. Yes. But I yes. wanted to, as uh, Sergio wanted to put all the information together in, what, in one webinar, uh, there are some interesting cases that uh, uh, papers that were published and uh, we could mention. Of course, we all know, and it's very classical, mm -hmm. that the inferior pouch or the axillary pouch is retracted. And you can see a case, uh, I could say, in which is a little bit redundant on the left and the retraction on the right. But we, in the last decades, began to look at the rotator interval. And we know that the rotator interval has a very interesting rule in shoulder motion. We know that the rotator interval is involved in the inferior uh, stability and in the posterior instabi stability of the shoulder. So, when the, rota ro uh, the rotator interval is insufficient, <clears throat> it contributes to instability. And when it is retracted, it contributes to frozen shoulder. The rotator interval is a triangle, uh, which base is the coracoid. Its uh, anterior border is the superior border of the subscapularis and its posterior border is the anterior border of the supraspinatus. Mm -hmm. And it contains three structures, the coracohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament, and the biceps, the, the, the tendon of the biceps. And 
Menjardi, with uh, Christian Gerber, published in 2004 a very interesting paper in which they uh, checked the MRIs of patients with frozen shoulder and compared it with normal patients. And they just measure the, the coracohumeral ligament and they measure the thickest portion of it. They check the thickness of the capsular in the rotator interval and the thickest portion of the capsule in the inferior pouch. And they found that patients with frozen shoulder had a significant thicker coracohumeral ligament, that the capsule in the rotator cuff interval was significantly thicker, and there were no differences in capsular thickness in the axillary recess, but the volume of the inferior pouch axillary recess was smaller in patients with frozen shoulder. So this is showing us something that Sergio for, for sure will mention later, that if we go, uh, in, we have, uh, go through all the um, conservative treatment with no results and we go to arthroscopic surgery, we need to go to the rotator interval and to the axillary pouch. And it is not necessary to perform any kind of release at the posterior capsule, except that we check in, in the evaluation and the anesthesia that it, it is worth to do that. Another uh, concept that these authors gave us is what they call the subcoracoid fat triangle, that it is limited uh, for, by the coracohumeral ligament, the coracoid process in the anterior aspect, and the joint capsule. And they saw that there is a progressive obliteration of this triangle proportional to the limitation of the range of motion. But as everything, everything in um, frozen shoulder, the, we have just the opposite point of view. <laughs> and this, <laughs> this was a very interesting paper um, presented at the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery that we had uh, last year in Buenos Aires, and you were there, Sergio. And we uh, see that these very important authors uh, evaluate the parameters that Gerber and Menjardi publish, and uh, they study the, the capsule with uh, some in a contrast enhanced magnetic MRI. And they found that in 10 patients, with a frozen shoulder after failed conservative treatment comparing with the contralateral shoulder, that there were no big difference in the glenohumeral ligament. Uh, there were not big difference in the uh, subcoracoid uh, fat triangle, but there were difference uh, that the contrast show very clearly. So their conclusion was that the enhancement of the joint capsule uh, is more important to detect frozen shoulder than the uh, other structures that were mentioned before. And to finish, uh, a paper published in India and that is very interesting that have shown that there is a correlation with the findings on MRI and the stage of the frozen shoulder. So this is very interesting mm -hmm. because the stage will in some way conduct our treatment approach. And we are making decisions just using clinical, clinical findings, but this gives us the, the, the chance to support our decisions uh, in um, findings on the MRI. So this is, was uh, a general idea of what we can expect from that. Okay, I just wanna make some comments before we go to Dr. Juan's uh, aspects on ultrasound. 
and then we will talk about management. See, first of all, I want the audience, the, the, not, the, not, the, the general audience with many guys who are not shoulder surgeons to understand that in spite of the, the very interesting issues uh, of, the, uh, of MRI, okay, all of these findings that Dr. Daniel has shown us is not to add more confusion to our decision-making process. This is very important. I don't want, well, we don't want, and we won't have the audience leaving this uh, webinar with more confusion because this is something that we really have to avoid. So, the, and for the audience to understand, I was in the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery as Dr. Daniel was there. He was the president, the president. And I was impressed at how we were discussing the limits of knowledge. It was very difficult because we were, everybody was discussing the limits, okay? And this is uh, what some papers were discussing, very interesting. But in spite of that, uh, when we have a basic understanding of the clinical behavior, we can manage that and the obliteration of the axillary recess, I guess that would be the most important MRI landmark for us to help us in the diagnosis of uh, frozen shoulder. Do you agree, Daniel? Uh, I love it, your presentation, but I want to make things clear for the audience yes. who are not, not shoulder uh, specialists. So far, yeah, so far I look at the rotator interval and yes. the axillary recess. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, those areas. I, I find this paper very interesting by Itoi, and, uh, but what is classical is, you will show for sure uh, the rotator interval in- uh, and the axillary recess. Because, and, mm -hmm. Yeah because I'm gonna ask you a question, much probably you will agree with me. In spite of being so interesting, these last papers that you have shown, they are very difficult to reproduce in our clinical practices. Do you agree with me? Yes, yes, that's true. And I just wanted to show how controversial is every point in frozen shoulder, yes. you know, yes. uh, just, just to bother you. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's lovely, it's lovely, <laughs> but uh, in spite of that, coming back to the audience, it's the yes. obliteration of the axillary recess is the retraction in the rotator interval and always correlated, of course, to With the clinical, clinical findings. findings. But you see yeah. now, yeah, but now we will see something different, at least to me, now I'm going to learn a lot because mm -hmm. Dr. Juan, uh, can you show us how ultrasound can be, or may be, I would say a very interesting tool in the diagnostic point of view. This is a very interesting uh, aspect of the, the webinar now. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Let me start by showing you in advance the uh, five points of my speak. This speak is uh, divided into two parts. The first three points is about uh, diagnosis and the last two points is about treatment of a uh, frozen shoulder. Um, of course, uh, ultrasound is a, a useful tool for the diagnosis of secondary causes of a stiff shoulder, but uh, my speak is to analyze the use of ultrasound in frozen shoulder, idiopathic frozen shoulder. Okay. First, we um, are uh, try to describe the ultrasound findings in rotator cuff interval, following by axillary recepts capsule. Ten years ago, Ottenheim have developed this systematic review and meta-analysis about the use of ultrasound in subacromial disorders. In the introduction, authors highlight shoulder complaints is a complex problem, 
and probably when we analyze the uh, use of ultrasound in frozen solder, this problem is more complex indeed. In this study, give us three important messages. First, the use of frequencies higher than 10 megahertz increase sensitivity and specificity. Second, ultrasound needs the combination of medical history and physical examination. And third, ultrasound is useful as a diagnostic value when we work at secondary care setting. And the authors were uncertain whether the diagnostic value of ultrasound would be similar when we use in primary care settings. So, solar compliance is a complex problem. We need medical history and physical examination. We need proof high frequencies and our use depends on when you work. Secondary care is good, but primary care may be yes or, or not. My master tell me this, uh, this message. Be realistic. So you need an adequate training before to use the ultrasound as a diagnostic. If you have the right ultrasound equipment and work in the right place, then you can consider using ultrasound as a correct medical history and examination, always after a correct medical history and physical examination. But what about the use of ultrasound in uh, frozen solar? This year, 2020, Wu et al. develops this systematic review and meta-analysis in which conclusion gives us the same need of physical examination and medical history. This is a tool that you can add it to existing clinical diagnostic protocols. However, ultrasound represents an important and useful eye for approach to frozen shoulder. But what are the findings on frozen shoulder that we can get from ultrasound examination? We can group them in two groups. The first two is related to uh, dynamic examination and the last three are related to uh, findings in the interval, rotator, rotator interval. Talking about the first one, limitation of movement of the supraspinatus, you need to see this video. In, this is the acromial. Here, the humeral head, and this is the supraspinatus tendon. When you ask the patient for move the, the arm in abduction, the supraspinatus tendon moves and go inside the subacromial, subacromial space. Of course, this is not specific of a frozen shoulder. You can see it in another disorders of subacromial joint. Next finding, is more sensitive even, and is uh, the study of the subscapular tendon in the typical and classical assessment uh, in, in the uh, examination by ultrasound. You start always putting the short axis of the proof in this position. In this position, you can see a transversal uh, section of the long head of the visa tendon inside the group. Over there, there is a line, white line, that is the transverse ligament, deltoid muscle above, and here appears the subscapularis tendon. And when you ask the patient for rotate, give an external rotation to the arm, you can see appears 
the subscapularis tendon here completely. And that's not happen when a person has a frozen shoulder. The next slide is about the rotator cuff interval. Probably Rodwood had written the Bible of the shoulder, the most important book for a study the shoulder. In the chapter about uh, the frozen shoulder, he reminds us that Pasteur in 1932 explained that a cogenic material that adherence in the long head of the biceps tendon and rotator interval is a common finding. This finding is very difficult to see it uh, using ultrasound technology, but the other two are very accessible for ultrasound uh, examination. I recommend you this uh, paper, probably one of the best that link anatomy and ultrasound. And in this paper, Tamborini gives us the keys for and a, a correct examination of the uh, rotator interval. This is the first position, the start, and this is the modified crash position, uh, asking for the patient to put the hand inside the pocket and the, the proof go upper and with a rotation of 30 degrees. In this position, we can see the long half of the vitreous tendon, the cora humeral ligament, and the subscapularis tendon and the supraspinatus tendon uh, as the meaning uh, findings. It's very important to identify correctly the long head of the vitreous tendon, and it's easy if you try to play with the anisotrophy. Anisotrophy is the quality that tendons have and is the change in sensitivity, change in intensity of the echo when you uh, move the sound, the probe, uh, uh, from uh, 19 degrees to uh, change the position and you can change the intensity of the echo in the, uh, in the thickness of the tendon. This is due to a physical phenomena in the interface that uh, due to phenomena of reflection and refraction different uh, due to angulation of the uh, ultrasound. Let me show you um, a video in which the angulation of the proof can change the intensity of the long head of the beta tendon here in the center of the picture. And what about the coracohumeral ligament and thickness? Um, with uh, ultrasound, we can uh, see the coracohumeral ligament in this position with a, a loss of echogenicity. And sometimes we can see it with difficult because there are a lot of findings in, around the long head of the vitreous tendon and it's very difficult to recognize it. The last point of the rotator interval is the increase of vascularity around the long head of the vitreous tendon. And this is a one picture from our clinic and we can see it using Doppler, the, uh, the increase of vascularity around the long head of the vitreous tendon. And this point is about the axillary with X capsule um, let me introduce it to an axillary sonographic of the shoulder. This paper gives us four important messages. First, you need a linear proof of at least 12 megahertz. Second, normal thickness of the um, capsulosynovial recess is less than 2.8 millimeters. This uh, thickness is increased upper to four millimeters in cases of frozen shoulder and pay attention to the echogenicity because in uh, when fibrosis is present, echogenicity is increased and varies with an isotrophy. This is a, a, a picture that compares normal on the left with frozen shoulder on 
the left of the picture. Dr. Moya tells us the use of MRI as a tool for the diagnosis of the frozen shoulder. And this author, King et al, develops this study trying to prove a good correlation between air MRI and ultrasound with an error of 0.83, but both MRI and ultrasound have no good correlation with clinical assessments. In conclusion, they give us a cutoff value of 3.2 for the thickness of the uh, recessed capsule in, in the axillary, but a clinical assessment is needed as well. So what can we do with ultrasound for the more easy to the most complex? First, restriction of the sternal rotation. Why? Because give us the highest sensitivity. We need a proof of at least 10 megahertz. Second, axillary sex thickening. Why? Because it gives us the highest specificity. And we need a proof of at least 12 megahertz. And third, rotator interval abnormality. You need a Doppler to uh, study it. And the last one is for the future because coracomeral ligament thickening, there are only few studies about it and that's not concluded. And the last one uh, slide is to remember all of you that frozen shoulder is a physical diagnosis and ultrasound is only an aid and um, a useful tool for improve your task in the diagnosis of a very complex problem of the shoulder. So very nice, a lot of new things to me. And I just want the audience to understand that Dr. Juan mentioned a very important point. Clinics is everything. And the ultrasound must be understood through the light of the clinical findings. So it's not only having a wonderful ultrasonographist as Dr. Juan Miguel's, but uh, is having a good in interpretation of the findings through the light of the clinical uh, findings. And this is the same for MRI. Uh, and, and I guess that the ultrasound guided uh, suprascapular nerve blocks is gonna be the highlight of your presentation, Dr. Juan, because it, it has a, a lot of uh, application in the clinical uh, practice. But having said that, I think that now we can discuss management because I have a lot of experience with suprascapular nerve blocks and Dr. Daniel too, and Dr. Juan too. And I wanna start saying something like that to throw more confusion to the story. I was reading many papers uh, to do this presentation and there was a paper for 2019 in the BMJ, very recent about what is the best treatment for frozen shoulder. And the conclusion is that they cannot say anything. I'm serious. According to them, it's just physiotherapy and they do not even mention suprascapular nerve blocks, which made me very, I would say, unhappy because we have been doing this for a lot of time. So uh, what we will do now, um, uh, let's start talking about the management. I am a super fan of suprascapular nerve blocks and you guys too. Uh, I made a short presentation, seven minutes about how do I do this blindly for people to compare with ultrasound guided. But before I start, it's a seven, 10 minutes presentation max, five, seven minutes. Dr. Daniel, your considerations on management, your principles and suprascapular nerve blocks. Now let's go to management, which is a key point. Yes, I am also a fan of the suprascapular nerve, nerve block. Uh, it seems to me it is a very reliable procedure. And, you know, Rockwood used to say that shoulder rehab has four steps. 
The first step is to control uh, pain. The second step is to recover motion. The third step is to recover strength. And the fourth step is to maintain for a long time the uh, exercises by the patient. And uh, this is a very important point. And another important point is to make the patient realize that they need to uh, be involved in rehab and uh, take a very active position in rehab. So, because some paper, some patients say, okay, I go three times a week to the physiotherapist and I am done. Uh, you know, I, I did what I was supposed to do. And it is not like that. Uh, the, the programs should be home-based and the patients should, we, should work every day, several times. I always speak about homeopathic dose of re exercises, not to produce pain and to, you know, uh, distribute the, the program of exercises during the day. Yeah. So yeah. perhaps uh, three sessions uh, every day, um, dedicating 10 minutes. 10 minutes. To the show, 10 minutes. Is enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Devayan is going to talk about that. But uh, let me show you guys how do I do the suprascapular nerve block. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we can see how Dr. Juan does it in ultrasound. And Devayan is going to talk and we can make comments over there. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I'm sharing it. This is my, my first presentation, which is fast. So just a second, just a second. Uh, are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? Not yet. Uh, no, oh. yes. No, we yes. can see. It. So uh, just to make the audience know that uh, Dr. Ashok has created, well, we have created Orto TV Brazil, and we want to make it spread through whole Latin America, definitely with the help of, of Dr. Daniel. And this is very important. So I made it very pedagogically with a patient that I am treating. And then I really want Dr. Daniel to comment upon it before we see the ultrasound guided. So see, so this is a right shoulder. I want people to understand that all of these uh, drawings, they are in my mind. But uh, with a lot of experience, I don't have to draw anything. But when you start, start understanding the anatomical landmarks. So this is a right shoulder. This is the acromial posterolateral corner. This is the acromial anterolateral corner. I am seeing here the scapular spine, the spine of the scapula, and here the coracoid. So having said that, I will, uh, after that, I will draw a line from the coracoid to the spine of the scapula. And having said that, I'm gonna then have in my visualization a triangular area. And it's in the middle of this triangular area that I have to do my suprascapular nerve blocks. Uh, I developed this after reading so many papers and years discussing this, which is very common in Brazil. Uh, so I have a triangle, which has three sides, of course. So from an, an, an anatomical point of view, the posterior side of the triangle is the anterior part of the scapular spine. The anterior part of the, the anterior side of the triangle is the posterior border of the clavicle. And the, mid, the medial base, the medial line of the triangle is that coracoid line that I have uh, drawn. And having said that, I'm gonna come with uh, a needle, 10 cc of xylocaine in, that, uh, in the middle of the triangle, and I'm gonna put that. So let me show you how I do it. I saw this patient three days ago after four blocks, he's fantastic. So you, you clean it with uh, povidine or uh, lorexidine. This is what I am using now. If you know how to do it, 
it's very less painful. So I am coming with a little in inclination from anterior to posterior. I use around 10 cc, Let, uh, but we will discuss it, the volume now. The patient accepted. I've been doing there for 13, 15 years. And, uh, and you have to stop and aspirate. I'm gonna show you now just to see that there is no blood coming. I didn't do it during, but I'm, I'm gonna show you now. I'm aspirating it, it, it's okay. And that's it. So it's very easy when you know how to do it. And uh, I have been doing it blindly for 15 years in spite of the fact that doing it by ultrasound is not very elegant, but can be more precise. Uh, Dr. Daniel, what do you think about my technique? Is it right? <laughs> Is it right? Uh, and then well, we uh, some guided. Uh, I use the same spot, completely the same. Uh, we call it here in Argentina the Dean King spot that was yeah. described in 1950 by Dean King. And but you know. The the Ankin sounds like a, a surname from Galicia, isn't it, Sean? The Ankin? Yes. Yes. Well, we put the needle, but I go from the opposite direction. You know, okay. I go from back. Uh, we put the needle perpendicular to the scapula. Then we we remove it uh, some millimeters, we go back some millimeters, we aspirate and we go forward some millimeters. Uh, we change the angle. So we begin with, well, this is anterior. And so we go to anterior, aspirate, and then inject the, um, the, the anesthetics or whatever. Uh, in this kind of procedure, uh, it is different to other type of procedures. We don't look for paresthesia. I, I have no, seen no, paresthesia. No, no, no. Uh, we don't even need to, to go very close to the nerve because the cloud of uh, what we inject will go through. We'll do the job. We'll do the job. Yes. Yeah. But. That's the point. And I agree with you that it's a very reliable procedure. Super, very reliable. And many friends of mine here in Brazil, uh, they are doing it ultrasound guided. I think it's very elegant. Before we see Dr. Juan's technique, what do you think uh, about ultrasound, uh, Daniel? I mean, your experience, my one is zero. Uh, what do you think about it? Have you done it? It's very elegant, I know. It's more, it's said to be more, more precise. I'm talking because I still have to learn a lot, but your thoughts before we see uh, Dr. Juan's technique. Uh, Daniel. I yes, I think that everything that can give you more, uh, you know, uh, a, a more accurate procedure is welcome. So, but, uh, the point is that this procedure is so useful that yes. a, a, a doctor that do not have the ultrasound, the ultrasound should not feel that he shouldn't do this because yes. it's, uh, I have seen one, it was not a case that I treat, it was not a case that uh, I, I received. It, it is a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlos Seidenberg from Buenos Aires that he, receive a doctor, a patient that was a doctor, that uh, suffered a, an aneurysm of the suprascapular artery after mm -hmm. this procedure. So we must consider that. Uh, it's very yeah. strange, it's, it's not common. Yeah. No method, no invasive method has, uh, it's you know, free it's, from, it's, it's free, free from, from complications. complications. Yes. That's it. Well, Devayani has a lot of experience in physio. She will dedicate to breast cancer. But before that, Dr. Juan, I'm very good. I'm very anxious to see your ultrasound, ultrasound guided in uh, suprascapular nerve block. Can you show us?
It seems to, to be some questions from the audience. I'm gonna check them uh, while Dr. Juan will show the ultrasound. Okay. A suprascapular nerve block may be developed as a tool to improve the diagnosis. Uh, for example, for the yeah, different diagnosis between frozen shoulder and uh, pain inhibit motion in, in, in a shoulder. And we can use it as a treatment uh, as well. First description to my knowledge uh, was about uh, one, 1994. And the uh, description of the ultrasound approach was developed by uh, Stephen Glater in 2012. Let me show you a, a video about the target of this block. We can see the shoulder, and this is our target, the suprascapular nerve block here. It's very close to the artery. That is very important for the ultrasound target. And this is the transfer ligament that we can see in this picture about the, the ultrasound target. This is the scapula. This is the trapezius supraspinosus. This is the yeah. transfer ligament. And here we have something similar like a spoon, and inside this spoon is the uh, suprascapular nerve block. If we, you can use um, Doppler, you can see the artery, in, in this case it's below the, the transverse ligament, but sometimes it's upper. This is a video that trying to get the target for the injection using Doppler, and after that, you must turn out, out uh, turn off Doppler because you need to see here how is the distension when you inject the an local anesthetic. Okay. Back to the anatomy, we can see another approach in this knot. Here, the suprascapular appears and it's very close to the joint, to the posterior recess of the joint. And this may be a good option in some times. We can see here, this triangle is the recess, and here is the appearance of the suprascapular nerve. In this video, we can see the recess and the knot. Which one is better? Landmark guide suprascapular nerve block or a ultrasound guide? This is a, a recently published randomized control trial, 2020, about the co comparison of the effectiveness of ultrasound guide versus landmark guide suprascapular nerve block in chronic shoulder pain. And the conclusion of the author is that both are useful and both needs to combine with other treatments as well. Another technique that can improve a frozen shoulder is the dilatation of the joint. This is the target. Here we can see again this triangle that is the recess, the posterior recess of the joint. And here we can see the needle inside this triangle. Wait a moment. Here it is. The needle. The needle. And now 
the distension of the joint. Here, okay. Perhaps next video, he has a better image, imaging here, the, the needle and the distension of the joint after the injection. Wow. Okay, um, two more slides about the uh, reference of this technique. Uh, this is um, one of uh, Lin et al. in 2007, and we can compare efficacy of intraarticular storage injection and distension in patients with frozen shoulder. And in this systematic review, authors have the following recommendation. In phase one, may be used for steroids. When sternal rotation is limited, distension may be useful too. And in later stage, distension was not more effective than intraarticular steroid injection. And this other uh, meta-analysis give similar uh, conclusions about the use of uh, both techniques may be equiparable, may be similar in short and long place. Which one? Depends on the phase, depends on the diabetes, depends on the restriction of the external retention, any other considerations that your patient um, has. So there is no, uh, no uh, concrete recommendation but uh, you can use uh, both, depends on the kind of the patient you have on your clinic. Yeah. And that's Thank all. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And, uh, and you see, as Dr. Daniel said in the beginning, many controversies, but what I want people to understand is that... Um, Nevertheless, it's a very useful tool. It was written in one of Dr. Juan's papers. It's a very useful tool and blindly or ultrasound guided, it must be used. Dr. Daniel mentioned a very serious point. If you don't have an ultrasound to help you, don't feel bad about it. You can do it in the same way. And Dr. Juan mentioned that you, you must combine it with other points. And, and so physio is very important. But uh, uh, I have one question from Dr. Meraj Khan before Devayani speaks uh, about complications after 10 cc xylocaine uh, on the suprascapular blocks. Well, let me set one minute and Dr. Daniel and then Devayani speaks. Uh, I have been, I have done more than 1000, believe me, because it's very useful. I have never had any problems besides the fact that after 10, 15 minutes, the body starts to reabsorb that and the patients get a little bit dizzy. And I always tell the patient to stay in the clinic 30 minutes before all of this dizziness passes. I have a friend of mine whose patients was uh, submitted to a suprascapular nerve injection uh, and he went after five minutes to home driving and he was so dizzy after 10, 15 minutes, he had a car crash. So this is something that really cannot ha happen. So I asked my patient to stay 30 minutes in the office uh, before going home. I think that this is super important. Daniel, any thoughts about it? Well, I, I think that that is a very good advice. And um, besides what I told you about the aneurysm, uh, I didn't have uh, or I didn't uh, heard about he, hear about problems. You know, yeah. uh, I could say that the number one complication would be to have no reaction or no response from the patient. Yes. In yes. some cases, it could happen. But I even besides frozen shoulder have, for instance, some uh, ladies with an advanced age that have a 
osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint and are not eager to go through uh, arthroplasty. And they come once a year to get one, uh, you know, shot, block of the neuro uh, suprascapular nerve with good results. Sergio, can you hear us? No, my, my connection is unstable. Uh, yes. I am back now. Oh, so uh, uh, my connection was unstable. Are you listening to me now? Perfectly, yes. Okay, so, so, so. So uh, as I understood, because I, I couldn't hear your last phrase, uh, yes. in, when you have patients with arthritis who are not elective for many um, comorbidities or other uh, causes, to uh, uh, arthroplasty, a reverse, uh, you can do it. And I would understand it as a palliative procedure. Is it this? Yes. Yeah, but, it, but it's nice. And just to mention, I don't want to change the idea, but the idea of also putting some hyaluronic acid, synvisc intraarticularly is another idea. Yeah, it's another idea. It's valid. It may, I would say, give some relief for some time, but this is another discussion. But you mm -hmm. see, uh, so in summary, it's a, uh, to ask Dr. Meraj Khan, it's a, very, it's a very safe procedure. I'm very happy with that. And I think that we should stimulate people to do it together with physio. And now Devayani, please, I want to listen to you. Physio and especially breast cancer, she will see, she will show us something very interesting and then uh, I just, uh, and after that, I just want to make some comments. Uh, Devayani deals with something different, which is frozen shoulder with, with lymphedema. Lymphedema because of the lympho nodes that are removed after breast cancer uh, surgery. So that would be a relative contraindication for suprascapular nerve blocks to add more difficulty to her practice, okay? But let's see what she has to say. It's interesting. Devayani, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Sergio. Audible, I'm going to show you. Yeah, am I audible? So um, it was a very informative session till now, and uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure listening to all of the excellent speakers here. So my topic today will be frozen shoulder in association with a breast cancer treatment. See, I am a physiotherapist, and I am a certified... Just a second, Devayani, Devayani, yeah. just a second. I will ask you to speak with the microphone very, very... If not, we cannot hear you. No, we are not listening to you. I, I guess we are not listening to you. I guess I'm not listening to you. Uh, hello, am I yes, audible? No. Yes. Okay, fine. So I'm a physiotherapist and I am a lymphedema therapist as well. So uh, being a lymphedema therapist, I deal with a lot of cancer patients and I deal with the musculoskeletal problems associated with these patients, especially the breast cancer patients because lymphedema is very common with the breast cancer patients. So adhesive capsulitis is definitely one of the most uh, important uh, morbidities seen in these patients, like shoulder morbidity seen in these patients. And uh, it, it definitely leads a lot of uh, quality of life in these patients. Uh, kindly interrupt me if I'm not audible because the network seems a bit unstable here. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, uh, the adhesive capsulitis variables in these breast cancer patients are quite different than our routine patients. I need to 
focus on this. There are certain variables which we otherwise do not uh, see in our general orthopedic and physiotherapy practices. But these are certain variables we need to really focus right from the diagnosis or rather ruling out the other morbidities and making it sure whether it is a frozen shoulder or not. So a brief review I will be going on is breast cancer has a lot of impact on the quality of life of the patient right from the diagnosis to the treatment and even at the survivorship end. And arm and uh, shoulder dysfunctions are very common. It's a rate ranges around 30 to 50 percent in these patients. This was a research published in uh, 2018, and it showed that 53 percent of the patients uh, have, uh, of, uh, who have undergone breast cancer treatments, they uh, have this 53 percent of them have shoulder dysfunctions. That is a huge number, actually. And when we go on specifically to adhesive capsulitis, it's 22% prevalence among the breast cancer surgeries, especially mastectomy surgeries in the first five years, like post-operative five years. So five years are really, uh, you need to keep on checking. I need to educate the patient a lot that you may get a uh, pain in the shoulder and you need to inform that to us somehow. So this five years are really important. Out of these five years, a very crucial time when we get around 18% of prevalence of adhesive capsulitis is in the period of 13 to 18 months post-operatively. So the crucial time is two years. A lot of cases come in my clinical practice as well in these first two years post-operatively. So uh, a lot of education to the patient is needed. If you get pain, if you get some kind of restriction, inform us so that we can improve the quality of life and we can give a better uh, uh, thing to them. So we, we tell them that you have to see that uh, preoperative thing is very important because these are elective surgeries. Ample of time is there for a patient to get educated regarding this. And even postoperatively, a good patient education does help to catch this earlier. So that is also important. A general overview of some breast cancer surgeries here. Um, the breast cancer treatments have various parts, including surgery, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, etc. Surgeries which are there in the breast cancer treatments are lumpectomy, in which a lump is removed along with the tumor. Some subcutaneous tissue is also removed, and uh, this leads to a scar mark, and some lymph nodes may also be removed in this surgery. Wide excision is a bigger excision as compared to the lumpectomy excision, but the breast is definitely conserved in this. The most important is modified radical mastectomy. Modified radical mastectomy is the um, a mastectomy procedure in the whole breast is removed along with a lot of lymph nodes are removed. Initially, there was a procedure known as radical mastectomy, which the pectoralis major muscle was also incised and removed. But uh, that is no more used. It's around eight decades. They have, it has not been used, and I have not seen a single patient till date with that. Um, if, if, if any patient is alive with that radical mastectomy, she must be around 90s or even 100s. She must be around. So I have not seen any kind of this thing. Yes, modified radical mastectomy spares the pectoralis major muscle, which is a very important thing for shoulder dysfunction. Lymph node dissections, also known as LND in the short form. So the lymph nodes are very important in cancer surgeries, and this makes cancer surgeries different from any other general surgery because cancer tends to spread from the lymph nodes and lymphatic channels. So the surgeon definitely goes to removing these lymph nodes in many cases. So the axillary group of lymph nodes are removed. There are a hell lot of group of lymph nodes in the axilla, and the surgeon has to really uh, take efforts in uh, taking out a lot of them, which are they suspected to be uh, having the cancerous metastasis in them. A very interesting thing is the rotus group of lymph node. I find this quite interesting because it is the uh, it, it, this group of lymph nodes are level two lymph nodes. In this image, if we can see these lymph nodes are in the pink shade here, purple pink shade. It is the intrapectoral group of lymph nodes. It lies between the two pectoral uh, muscles, the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. So while dissecting these group of lymph nodes, the surgeon has to retract the pectoralis major muscle and do a lot of work to um, um, remove the lymph nodes from there. 
also there is a huge group of uh, very important structure near it which is the neurovascular pectoral neurovascular bundle we call it has a important nerves in it like um, the medial pectoral nerve the nerve to uh, serratus anterior and while dissecting these lymph nodes uh, there can be some trauma to this nerve though the surgeon tries to uh, tries a lot not to harm this nerve but sometimes they get severed or at least the neural sheath and they get irritated so the after effects of this even if the nerve is irritated the after effects of this are seen definitely seen uh, in the patient during rehabilitation so it is very important and the post mastectomy pain syndrome it mimics somewhat like frozen shoulder but the moment restrictions are not there so see we can immediately judge it out there if the patient has a lot of chest pain he she has a pain in the bicipital groove where the pectoralis major gets inserted and all those points but there is no moment restriction or rather there is no passive movement uh, no passive movement restriction active movements are restricted because of this pain next is the reconstruction surgeries these reconstruction surgeries i have deliberately included in this because whenever the breast tissue is reconstructed uh the this is done by the plastic surgery team and the cosmetology team so they what they do is they um, uh, they introduce a tissue expander for initial few days this tissue expander is a sort of a bag sort of structure which uh, they uh, input some saline water in it and to expand it but the placement of this tissue expander uh, is beneath the pectoralis major muscle so when they put it beneath the pectoralis major muscle the pectoralis major muscle covers the tissue expander and that leads to a lot of tightening of the uh, over stretching of uh, pectoralis major muscle also these patients have to restrict their shoulder joint movements beyond 90 degree for around 8 weeks sometimes 10 weeks because the plastic surgeons they are very specific they want a proper alignment of the tissue and with the shoulder movements they don't allow us to do that uh, beyond 90 degree also the risk of seromas are there if we uh, increase it to beyond 90 degree so see the restrictions in the moment uh, beyond 90 degrees for 8 to 9 weeks is a big time for the patient to get over protective uh, with their shoulder same thing is with the internal implants and flap surgeries flap surgeries as one of the very important reconstruction surgeries um, in which a uh, latissimus dorsi flap is taken from the patient's body or a rectus abdominis muscle flap is taken and then the breast tissue is reconstructed so there is light the alignment changes from the latissimus dorsi either of the same side or from the contralateral side if the graft is taken from rectus abdominis the posture and the other facial problems the patient can face have an impact on the shoulder joint mobility as well so while rehabilitation we have to consider these aspects a lot the donor site and the reconstruction site both radiation therapy is an adjuvant therapy is can be a new adjuvant therapy as well that is before surgery also radiotherapy can be given or it can be given after uh, the surgery but radiotherapy is a bombardment of uh, radio radiotherapy beams on the patient's body and especially in breast cancer cases it's near the chest uh, it leads to a condition known as radiation fibrosis see fibrosis word itself says that it is going to create some restrictions in the moment so it can be soft tissue restrictions skin fibrosis or even it can be uh, the muscle fibrosis to some extent if the beam is bombarded near the shoulder joint then the capsule is also involved in this and the patient gets more of restrictions uh, that is one of the probable reason uh, that after uh, uh, when we see the percentage of incidence of adhesive capsulitis um, this uh, radiotherapy ranks second after uh, uh, modified radical mastectomy cases so this is the second ranking one basically because of the fibrosis it creates some of the important therapies again are chemotherapy uh, certain drugs chemotherapy drugs are given to the patient as a part of cancer treatment and uh, many drugs do have uh, do give a side effect or you can say an effect of uh, myalgias fatigue and joint pains as well so during chemotherapy the patient if the patient is not quite active he will restrict a lot of his movements already a surgical scar in there so his shoulder movements will be restricted more if he is not educated properly 
properly for a good shoulder moment after breast cancer surgery. And this can indeed lead to an adhesive capsulitis. A very important thing uh, with the psycho-emotional element is hormone therapy. 75% of the breast cancer tumors which are there are estrogen dependent. So a hormonal therapy which is given has an anti-estrogenic drugs in there. So anti-estrogenic drugs are given to the patient. They have a tendency to create some depression and anxiety amongst the patient. Also, the patient is premenopausal or in the menopause case, again, this anxiety and depression will be there. Uh, so the hormone therapy plays a role in the psycho-emotional element of the patient. One important thing I usually encounter with my clinical practice in these patients is body image. Body image. These patients are very low confident, very depressed many a times because they have lost an important feminine part of their body. So they, I have seen extreme cases in this sometimes what happens is the patient does not even see herself in the mirror she, she doesn't want to see herself in the mirror she doesn't touch that body part she doesn't want her partner to look at the body part and that creates a lot of depression and uh, a lot of psycho emotional problems with the patient uh, these patients when they come for to me for adhesive capsulitis a real psychological study of these patients is very important to know if we should refer this patient to the oncopsychologist along with our physiotherapy treatment or it's okay. And there are certain tools to do that, very quite easy tools, hardly five minutes time it takes in the clinical assessment. Another therapy, which is a treatment for breast cancer patients is immunotherapy, wherein the, some immunotherapy drugs are uh, given to the patient to boost up his immunity. Um, till date, there are no researches which suggest that immunotherapy leads to any kind of uh, problem and dysfunctions with the shoulder independently. Coming to some shoulder morbidities after breast cancer treatments, it is most common in modified radical mastectomy patients followed by radiotherapy patients. So these two groups are very prone to get shoulder dysfunctions and shoulder morbidities, which include shoulder range of motion restrictions, uh, shoulder and arm pain both. Uh, posture and scapular positioning is is definitely altered in the next slide. I'm going to go into detail of that and breast cancer related lymphedema. Lymphedema is a fluid accumulation, subcutaneous fluid accumulation in the tissue. And because these patients, they lack a lot of lymph nodes. So breast cancer related lymphedema should always be observed. It is again, it again gives to uh, raise to a lot of shoulder problems. Coming to scapular kinematics. Um, a study by Shamley D in 2012 showed that uh, the shoulder and scapular kinematics uh, in the ra modified radical mastectomy patients are uh, altered bilaterally, even at the contralateral side they are affected, and even uh, they, can, they may not have any pain also, but after a few years that can be a problem. Uh, secondary, the shoulder comorbidities and the scapular comorbidities are seen up to six years after surgery six years after surgery is like you have to continuously monitor the patient for that any kind of shoulder morbidity and educate her. Pectoralis and the force couple in adhesive capsulitis. Um, a study by Donatelli has uh, very nicely showed that these adhesive capsulitis patients have a specific scapular alignment. The scapula is anteriorly tilted. It is more of the internal rotation uh, thing. And the same thing is seen in the breast cancer patients also uh, with respect to the pectoralis minor tightness. The pectoralis minor muscle goes into tightness and this pulls the scapula anteriorly, giving an anterior tilt resembling that of adhesive capsulitis. So uh, this postural assessment is also very important. Now there are these certain factors which need to be assessed when the patient is referred to the Department of Physiotherapy or the patient is referred to uh, uh, orthopedician, more with the physiotherapy, I should say. Seroma. Seroma is the collection of fluid after surgery and it is very common in breast cancer patients. And to avoid this seroma, uh, the breast cancer patients immediately post-operatively, they have, they, we have to restrict their movement. It is like a reverse rehab we have to do with them. We have to restrict their shoulder joint movement to 90 degree. I have seen a few patients who have a good shoulder joint range motion uh, suggested by the surgeons and all, and then they land up into seroma. 
सीरो इज नॉट गुड इट इज नॉट गुड बिकॉज इट इज अ कॉज ऑफ इन्फेक्शन एंड इट इज अ बिगर पैथोलॉजी दैन शोल्डर जॉइंट रेस्ट्रिक्शन सो वी शुड नॉट बी अ पार्ट इन क्रिएटिंग एनी काइंड ऑफ सीरोमा टू द पेशेंट एंड इट इज बेटर टू रेस्ट्रिक्ट द मूवमेंट टू नाइंटी डिग्रीज एंड फॉर नियरली टू टू थ्री वीक्स and then we can go for a routine uh, shoulder range of motion exercises this uh, restriction usually doesn't lead to adhesive capsulitis the initial two weeks it won't result in adhesive capsulitis because the patient is the initial range is moving but after that he is not moving and after two weeks we are allowing him to move so it's okay with that uh, postural dysfunctions yes uh, need to very much assessed with respect to scapula thoracic spine and the uh, um, neck muscles and neck positioning as well a very important point here is axillary web syndrome in this picture here we see um, a a cord like structure in the axilla as well as something in this cubital fossa here so this is known as cording or axillary web syndrome it is so basically um, because of the coagulation of the lymphatic vessel there can be a single cord there can be two cords there can be three cords in this and this is a very taut band there are various names to this uh, cording axillary web syndrome taut bands everything so this is a very important aspect because axillary region assessment is important if the patient is coming to us with some kind of shoulder pain and active and passive movement restrictions in axillary web syndrome also we get uh, um active active and passive range of movement restrictions but this axilla should be definitely seen in this because if cording is there so you need to go for cording now this cording an interesting study by moswitz uh, was done and he said that yes cording is definitely there with uh, lymph node dissections but in one case of him he had a um, very interesting case uh, in which uh, a patient came for the shoulder pain and movement restrictions and then he was uh, while assessment we uh, he diagnosed um, uh, axillary web syndrome and then the patient was uh, sent for uh, why is he having an axillary web syndrome so he was sent for further management and uh, lymph angioma was diagnosed so uh, it can be the reverse way round sometimes only few studies on that but we should not uh, neglect even a single study so without cancer also uh, axillary web syndrome is found a study was published in the uh, can, uh, uh, in the chiropractic association journal in 2016 and it showed that uh, it was on a squash player so the player was squash player he had some pains and movement restrictions in his uh, shoulder joint uh, specifically the inferior part and when he was assessed there was a uh, axillary web syndrome see there was no cancer thing in that he was diagnosed with everything there was no cancer aspect in that but still axillary web syndrome was there so it is very important i can speak a lot on this but i'll restrict myself to adhesive capsulitis related thing with uh, uh, axillary web syndrome and scar tissue uh, adhesions uh, because this is a big incision it starts from the sternum and goes to the uh, uh, deep inside the axillary fold it is a big incision and a lot of uh, scar tissue adhesions are there it depends on the type of and extensiveness of the surgery and most common scar tissue adhesions are found in the lateral part just below the axilla so this is to be assessed uh, when we are assessing for adhesive capsulitis pectoralis muscle tightness both the pectoralis muscles the pectoralis major muscles as well as the pectoralis minor muscle uh, long term uh, ha having a tightness uh, for a long term will restrict the patient's movement and then that will lead to adhesive capsulitis there are high chances of that patterns of restrictions and impingements as already discussed in the initial speakers have already discussed with that yes we need to look after if any impingements are there and the patterns of restrictions are there because uh, adhesive capsulitis follows a very significant pattern a lot of internal rotation is restricted abduction is restricted inter uh, external rotation is restricted in impingement syndromes not all these movements are restricted so you need to really have a good physical examination whether it is an impingement syndrome or whether it is an adhesive capsulitis lymphedema yes this is a big lymphedema limb one of my patient has uh, had it after her uh, breast cancer surgery not always lymphedema will be this big in the initial stages it will be very less so you have to keep a eagle eye on it like uh, whether it is developing a lymphedema or not 
and obviously surgical and medical details are very important whether the patient is uh, having some other uh, problems like is he diabetic is he on anti depressive drugs is he on hormonal therapy what are the surgical details of the patients these are all very important and you should never overlook that you should always have a deep uh, good knowledge of that frozen shoulder management in breast cancer patients um this is a very important point of view because a lot of patients they are referred to physiotherapy and rehabilitation and there are various concepts of rehabilitation there is one concept which is a phase wise rehabilitation which uh, uh, dr daniel had uh, just uh, given a few idea about that that the phase 1 we have more more concern about the pain management and we give very gentle exercises to the patient especially the cartman spindler exercises are the favorites among all the therapist but when i am dealing with lymphedema it the concept varies so i will be dealing it afterwards and uh, uh, the second phase is like more of a bit of stretching exercises because the pain has been reducing in that phase and we need to improve the range of motion the thawing mostly is the strengthening stage so yes phase wise rehabilitation has a lot of lot of reviews that it works magic with that and the patient needs a good uh, education for that and a patient has to uh, it's very important for the patient to uh, strict to the protocol continuously and if he is or she is having a lot of pain she won't comply with the exercise therapy protocol and that is where we need a lot of pain management to peep inside okay then uh, the same thing is one more rehabilitation protocol some of the physiotherapists very uh, very favorites in some of the physiotherapy clinics is pain predominant and restricted predominant rehab it's just um, it's like if it is a pain predominant then you have to look after the pain is your main goal if it is restriction predominant that makes your work more easier your scope of uh, giving a lot of things increases in that case more or less it goes hand in hand with the phase wise rehabilitation and pain predominant and rest restriction predominant rehab it is a uh, somewhat similar only uh, the the second one which is the pain predominant and restriction predominant doesn't stick to the time duration it doesn't stick to the time duration no less then a uh, secondly a uh, last i should say key to the frozen shoulder physiotherapy management in breast cancer cancer surgery patients is uh, a lot of manual lymphatic drainage lymph if it is getting collected some accent it is going to give a lot of discomfort and pain to this patient so you should have a good knowledge of lymphatic drainage this is different this lymphatic drainage is different than massage it is not massage it is it, i need to really uh, uh, press on this point that it is not massage it is a manual lymphatic drainage giving massage will create further more problems in this patients rather than uh, giving relief so it's not massage it is manual lymphatic drainage very important role whether the patient is having lymphedema or not but manual lymphatic drainage should always be given it gives a very good comfort to the patient some physiotherapy quick picks we will go fast on this is like soft tissue techniques yes a lot of soft tissue techniques right from scar mobilization cdx soft tissue techniques they are very helpful in these cases manual lymphatic drainage i already explained it works magic uh, every after every treatment of mine i definitely go for a manual lymphatic drainage kinesio taping uh, those who are not uh, like not aware of manual lymphatic drainage they can go for a kinesio taping this is a lymphatic lymphatic technique i have applied in this patient uh, she was again a frozen shoulder patient and after giving some mobilization techniques i gave her this uh, um, kinesiology taping which helped her in uh, some giving some pain relief and some lymphatic drainage after that and decongestive therapy uh, exercises are very important they should go hand in hand with the frozen shoulder rehab they are very easy exercises and very less time consuming exercises they can be given along with the frozen shoulder rehab definitely capsular stretches are very important in especially in the second phase of uh, frozen shoulder uh, we do a lot of capsular stretch within the pain limit of the patient it is very important within the pain limit of the patient because if we cross this pain limit there will be more inflammation and the patient won't give you response to that extent so having your hand and uh, looking at uh, where to stop is very important or uh, where to start is obviously important but where to stop is more more important 
muscle stretching exercises as a part of uh, uh, frozen shoulder should be incorporated, especially in the mastectomy cases, because this is a secondary frozen shoulder. It has, it is going yes. to have some other pathological elements along with it. It cannot come single-handed. It will have some of the other things with it. So we have to take care as a, of the patient as a whole to improve the complete quality of life of this patient. And gentle passive movements, yes, very, very important because these are pain-free movements and the patient loves this movement. This keeps uh, this gives us a, a benefit of preserving the available movement. This is very important. Group therapy. I love this aspect, but because of this corona crisis, we are unable to do group therapy in these patients. But our uh, breast cancer surgery patients with adhesive capsulitis, even a group of three patients, really helps them in improving faster than an individualized therapy programs because they tend to see people amongst themselves. This gives a very big emotional uh, and uh, support to the patient, which helps in their recovery even in the frozen shoulder. So I love this. I love this. The therapist, uh, the physio, uh, the physio therapist enjoys this the patient enjoys this and we get a good result out of this i hope this covid goes fast and we get some other things out of it um, some tools are very important in the physiotherapy quick fix is the dash dash refers to a uh, disability of arm and shoulder that is a dash it is a questionnaire it is a questionnaire which uh, uh, gives you a brief idea about what the patient is feeling. It is a small, it is a question and it takes five minutes. Similar is a SPADI, which is a shoulder pain arm disability index. It is again an index which can give you a percentage of disability in the patient or impairment in the patient. And uh, this helps in our uh, prognosis of the disease. Very important. Next is QLQ BR23, that is quality of life uh, questionnaire for breast rehabilitation 23. This is a very important tool and any, any person dealing with adhesive capsulitis with a breast cancer surgery patient should have this questionnaire because it just doesn't deal with uh, the biomechanical or the movement aspect, but it has certain questions which are related to the sexual dis uh, dysfunction in these patients uh, with the body image of these patients and with the psychological uh, well-being of this patient. So when you give this questionnaire, we get a brief idea about what the patient is and where we have to work on, whether he, is, he needs more of psychological support, whether he needs a lot or more of physiotherapeutic support. So this questionnaire is, uh, I always have this questionnaire with me with any kind of pain I deal with. Mobilizations and glides, definitely the anterior posterior glides and the inferior glides are very important. They are uh, grade two and grade one glides. I don't recommend, this is my personal recommendation. I don't recommend grade three and grade four glides because again, we should not increase the pain and create an inflammation. Grade one and grade two glides are known to reduce the pain and give a good joint play. And we are just gonna create some joint play in this. Scapular exercises, as initial studies have shown, a lot of scapular kinematics are altered in these patients. So scapular uh, exercises are very important. This is my patient. She came to me for lymphedema management. And this bandage in her hand here is a part of uh, the complete decongestive therapy we give for lymphedema. And it is advisable for the patients with lymphedema to go with exercises with these compression bandages or at least with compression garments proper compression garments. So this is the, the scapular exercises even can be given in phase one, phase two, because these are very, very, uh, uh, very simple active exercises uh, with like clock exercises for the scapula, 12 o'clock, six o'clock exercises with a dynamic surface, very important. One point I would like to focus is initially, because there is a lot of dyskinesis at the scapula, uh, the patient may have to voluntarily control the scapula to start with the exercises. So it's a, a reverse way round. Sometimes you need to voluntarily contract uh, the muscles and then uh, 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 go with the exercises. Or it, and after that, it will get activated and the patient can do much easily. But yes, scapular exercises are very important even with adhesive capsulitis patients in breast cancer cases, definitely. Consider intra-articular injections and nerve blocks with orthopedicians. 
uh, intra-articular injections are like the most common injections which are given are, gluco are, are the corticosteroids. I don't uh, personally, uh, uh, I, 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 do, I know that it creates a lot of problem in the joint, uh, but these injections are given and I, uh, I talk to my orthopedicians regarding this and it is their decision making whether to give a nerve block, whether to give an intra-articular injections and uh, because I want a pain relief, that is my concern. Yes. I want a good pain relief. So I do, uh, I do rec refer them to the orthopedicians and that it is their uh, department and it is their view what to give to the patient. But uh, I should say here, I should emphasize that um, intra-articular steroidal infections are not good for the joints. So uh, nerve locks or that's orthopedician decisions, definitely. Uh, patient education in all stages of adhesive capsulitis market in all stages of adhesive capsulitis so because uh, uh, the patient tends to you know get frustrated out of the she's she's not able to get the ranges since so long since three months four months then she gets frustrated and she then leaves the protocol so we have designed a good uh, patient education protocols by having some patient education subscriptions to the patient via their emails uh, some follow-up calls that how are you doing yes it is going to be there and you should keep the exercises going on or uh, some brochures but the, you need to continuously bombard the patient that yes exercise is going to help and it is going to take some time so do not leave the exercises so that is more important in the patient education part here uh, some of the interesting cases I would like to discuss here. Uh, this is a masked frozen shoulder case. Masked, I have said that it is a hidden. Whenever adhesive capsulitis thing with breast cancer comes, I find it like a treasure hunt. You have to move here and there and then get you get to a proper place where you, you want to go. So this is uh, the thing. She's a 56-year-old female uh, patient, uh, post-modified uh, ra radical mastectomy of the left side six months ago. She had developed a big seroma. I remember her seroma was quite big enough. It was showing like a complete breast coming up again. The, uh, so it was a big seroma. 700 ml was drained every alternate day. She had a quite a longer time of immobilization was given. Not immobilization, but restricted movements beyond 90 degree was given to her for six weeks post-op. Six weeks makes a month and that is quite a big time to develop a good adhesive capsulitis. Uh, she had good restrictions in the active and passive range of motions, both active and passive range of motions, external rotation, abduction, flexion, internal rotation since two months. So this is all based on the uh, clinical evaluation. Clinical evaluation, this uh, thing is very important to know whether active and passive range of motion. Severe pain in the movements and especially the night pain. Um, then the patient was given non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for three weeks. She got some pain relief, but uh, again, uh, after the drugs were stopped, again, the pain was there. So she was referred to the Department of Physiotherapy for further management under the category of secondary adhesive capsulitis. So this was doing some of the initial uh, exercises, stage one exercises already. She was on, uh, on NSAIDs. And then she was here. When we did an assessment, the assessment showed a good scar mobility. There was no significant muscle tightness. There was no impingement size. So now the question is, is it a frozen shoulder? With all the things we have done right now, it seems to be a big, a, definitely a frozen shoulder. Uh, phase one has, uh, like, she's still in phase one, you can say, but uh, a lot, quite a long time of uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis. She was terrible. She was terrible. She was about to cry in front of me. So she was there. And uh, one thing I, I'll, I'll go back. If we observe this patient uh, nicely, properly, there is something different in her, this arm. There was a cording, there was a cording, there was an axillary web syndrome. Though she was referred to our department under adhesive capsulitis, but cording was there. Cording was there and that can also be uh, restricting, but uh, it, is, it doesn't give an intense pain. Then the cording doesn't give an intense pain, which she was complaining, the night pains on all, cording doesn't give that, okay? But we have to work on cording as well, being a rehabilitation therapist. So significant, uh, when we worked on the cording with manual lymphatic drainage and certain cording techniques, there are axillary web techniques, which uh, the therapist know or uh, lymphedema therapist definitely knows. So we go for that and a general frozen shoulder rehab, which she was already doing. I added on with a modified Cordman's paradox 
this is a very different concept. Uh, there has been a few case studies on this. Um, I like to go with that because this gave me good results in some of my cases. This is my opinion. This is my opinion. There is uh, this Ravi Chandran has given a good uh, case study of this on modified Codman's paradox in the Saudi Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, this uh, this is like um, this was uh, given by Codman. Obviously, the Codman paradox is a lot of time used under manipulation manipulation under anesthesia by the orthopedic surgeons. This is a modified version of that in which a sequential movement is given to the patient similar to the Codman's paradox and uh, and this is given uh, is not given under anesthesia within the pain limits of the patient so it is like you have to move the limb to the flexion then to the abduction and a paradox of external rotation is there so I always accompanied it with some of the kinesio taping uh, aspect so we got a significant range of uh, motion improvements in the flexion, abduction, 20 degree uh, improvement in the internal and external rotation was there. Uh, but pain was persistent. Occasionally, there was some increase in the pain and internal rotation and external rotation was still a lot of restrictions was there, still a lot of restrictions was there. So that made me refer the patient back to the orthopedic department because the patient was not complying. He was, she was getting results. The results were comparatively good. We could have continued the uh, exercise protocols, but she was not complying even to the home exercise programs because of this uh, pain. So that made me refer the patient back to the ortho uh, department of orthopedics and then an intra-articular injection was given and then it was again followed by an intensive physiotherapy rehabilitation so with this we definitely got good results there was a full range of improvement in after like after intra-articular injections and intensive physical therapy rehab the remaining part which was we were not able to achieve that also was there after four weeks so the total recovery time this patient took was around two months plus the NSAIDs she had been taking three weeks before. So it was like she, she was very happy because we got all the ranges and we could go for the strengthening program for her. Um, uh, but I want to mention one point, though I don't I didn't get a thing in this patient, but uh, after certain intra-articular injections, uh, the, the patient tends to get back into the adhesive capsulitis phase somehow. I don't know. I think the orthopedic department will be a better answer to it with after injections also. They, they get some relief and they are doing some of the exercises, but again, they tend to go back to the phase two of uh, adhesive capsulitis. So that is something worrisome. This is another case. This is quite an uh, interesting case again. Uh, it's a 49 uh, years. Devayani, Devayani. Yeah. Just, uh, you see, I am loving your lecture. Uh, I am loving, I am mesmerized, but I will ask you, uh, you're speaking for 40 minutes now, so yes. I would love to listen yeah, to you to the that, rest uh, of the day. No, yeah. I, I just want you to uh, to go fast on this case and yes, come yes. to your... I'll, I'll just go, yes. This will, this will be the last uh, few slides, not more. Okay, I won't take much okay. of your time. Uh, so this was again a post-mastectomy case, 49 years old. Uh, there was significant pain. Since last four months, active and passive movements both were restricted in her case as well. Uh, there was a pectoralis major or minor muscle tightnesses also. Impingement test for supraspinatus came to be positive. So the question arises here whether it is an impingement syndrome or whether it is an adhesive capsulitis. Again, it can be a pain initiated movement restriction scenario. Definitely it can be. So it can be an adhesive capsulitis as well. So this is where our physical diagnosis, uh, physical evaluation is very, very important. So we gave some uh, soft tissue releases to this patient and some conventional physiotherapy and posture exercises. Two sessions of soft tissue mobilizations and the MLD gave a very good significant improvement in abduction. But, but the external rotation was still restricted in this case, still restricted, a good restriction was there. Four weeks of regular home exercise program was given to this patient, just home exercise program, normal routine phase wise, and follow up sessions were given, given two sessions per week for the initial two weeks, and she got external results. I love this photo because uh, she had a smile behind her mask, you can see yes. with her eyes. She here is she is very much discomfort and here she is having very much smile. That is what we want as a quality of life. So that is what we want. Uh, breast cancer related lymphedema is a very important thing because 33% of prevalence is seen in that and in these patients 20 to 50% are under adhesive capsulitis they develop adhesive capsulitis 
Uh, it occurs mostly 12 months after surgery and lymphedema is a really debilitating condition. So if we are giving some injectable form of any kind of injectable or semi-invasive thing to these patients, uh, we, may, we may develop a lymphedema after a few months in that patient. So this is something we need to stick on. It affects all ages. It affects all ages. There is no age limit in that. Uh, invasive and semi-invasive procedures should be considered like late in these dysfunctions. Okay. Then rehabilitation of adhesive capsulitis in breast cancer-related lymphedema is different, especially in phase one. We cannot give cordman's exercise as a heavy limb dangling out there. If you are giving a lot of cordman's pendular swing exercises, that will affect the rotator cuff because a lot of pressure, shear stresses on the rotator cuff in these cases. So you need to work on that. Joint mobilizations, uh, some considerations. Right? Like joint mobilizations can be given. Electrotherapeutic modalities. Um, there are no. So there are a lot of contradicting studies in this uh, part. But anything that uh, increases vasodilatation should not be given. It will increase in the lymphedema more. Heat and cold therapy. Again, some contradictions in that because it will lead to vasodilatation and again uh, cause of lymphedema increase in lymphedema. Gradual pro progressive protocol is always recommended. Always. Manual lymphatic drainage is highly recommended after every session. And if it is like second stage of lymphedema, and if any kind of semi-invasive or invasive thing is needed, consider complete decongestive therapy, which is a therapy for lymphedema, in addition to force and shoulder management, whether it be orthopedic, whether it be physiotherapeutic. So you should definitely consider complete decongestive therapy as a role, as an important part of the management of frozen shoulder in these cases. So to summarize, this is my last slide. Uh, frozen shoulder in breast cancer patient has intense symptoms and combined associated pathologies. It definitely takes time. If it is not taking time, it was not frozen shoulder. We need to understand that. If it is not taking time, it is not frozen shoulder. Understanding the lymphedema aspect in adhesive capsulitis management is very important and high quality primary research is required, especially in the secondary frozen shoulder in breast cancer patients. So we can thus identify, dismystify and treat this. It is a complex joint, but uh, it is we can we can it is not complicated, right? So this is what well, yes. About. Yeah. Uh, you see, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, sure. Well, see, I am mesmerized with your lecture. I'm sorry to ask you to 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 be a little bit fast. Uh, I'm I am a very sincere person. I loved your lecture. For the first time in my life, uh, I am thinking that in spite of the difficulties that I have in dealing with this case, I am relieved because you have many much more problems than I have. It's very difficult. I would love to stay one hour discussing this. We don't have it, but I think that very important points you have uh, reached. Again, you did a clinical diagnosis of uh, a secondary frozen shoulder in these cases. Depression is an issue. We have to take care of, of, of the psycho-emotional aspects, especially in these cases. But Dr. Daniel highlighted that it's super important and the only thing that calls my attention, and I'm going to stop and I want to hear Dr. Daniel, is that these patients, they can have problems up to five years after surgery. This is not common in my shoulder practice. If, if I do a proximal humerus fracture, I'm going to have uh, a secondary frozen shoulder in the next months or not, not after more than that. So uh, maybe there is something more but it's difficult and sometimes maybe these patients can be developing reflex sympathetic dis dystrophy. And this is something that we really have to pay attention because it's sometimes it's difficult to do a clinical diagnosis of a reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And we must pay a lot of attention in that. Uh, very interesting lecture. I'm very honored that you uh, gave us that. Um, I am really thinking that you have a lot of problems, much bigger than the ones I deal, and I deal with a lot of them. But, uh, well, I, I'm going to show my surgery, and then we will do a, a final discussion, because we are two hours and 20. I would love to have 10, 
10 hours to, to keep it because it's very nice. But very interesting lecture. I really want to uh, listen to Dr. Daniel, your thoughts about this different well, approach of the universe. No, it is an amazing clinical experience. I would like to highlight uh, one uh, statement that is, if it doesn't take time, it is not a frozen shoulder. And I love that statement because it, it is like that. And it is a, a way also to be sure of what we are dealing with, you know? So, and not to get depressed if it takes time because it is part of the, of the game. It's part of the of game. The, and the patient must know, we must know that and the patient must know that. So amazing. I just have a, a question to the Bayani is, uh, do you have any uh, experience? I don't know which is the situation in India with radial pressure waves uh, for the treatment because we have seen some papers uh, related to the use of radial pressure waves uh, in the treatment of frozen shoulder uh, and even for lymphedema. Uh, this, I personally do not have much of the experience in that, but the researchers do, I do go with the researchers, but I do personally do not have uh, experience with this particular therapy, I should say. So uh, commenting on that won't be a justice. Okay, and it is popular in India, the use of shock waves, radial pressure waves or uh, focus shock waves? Uh, shock waves, some of them are using uh, more of the matrix rhythm therapy these days is coming up. Uh, a new concept of matrix, matrix rhythm therapy is coming up. A lot of papers and case studies have been published on this. Only case studies have been published. So this is an upcoming thing with that. Uh, shock wave therapies, most of the therapies, they uh, therapists, they don't go for an electrotherapeutic, uh, um, they say, reliability on that. A lot of exercises and home exercises plans are only recommended here as well. Good. Uh, Daniel, and another thing is that you have mentioned how besides the suprascapular nerve blocks, physiotherapy is important. This is a, a, a common denominator of her whole lecture. So we should uh, uh, still highlight it to the, the audience. In, and Dr. Juan has said that it's a multiple approach with many tools and the physiotherapy it's a very important one and we have to, we don't have to be anxious and we have to make the, pa the patient understand that he doesn't have to be anxious because taking time is part of the game. Uh, I really wanna highlight that. Dr. Juan, any thoughts? Uh, I guess you will agree with me, but I, uh, your thoughts about this, Dr. Juan? No, we are not listening to you your microphone. Sorry. Yes, yes, of course, I completely agree with you. And I must uh, tell to Devajani, Dr. Devajani, congratulations on a splendid speech. Very nice speech and uh, I might completely agree with you with all you comment on your speech. Yeah, uh, well, and the thing is, surgery is a super exception. But I will show it now, it's a 10 minutes video. Uh, before that, Daniel, any more comments on Devayani's uh, lecture, which was beautiful, but uh, if you have to say any other thing, uh, I just wanna mention one thing because I have experience, but Daniel has a lot before I show the surgery um, in, the, in the end part of the webinar. Daniel, uh, how do you manage in terms of medication, these depressive aspects of the patient. I think this is a very important point. What kind of medications you use? Uh, I have an experience and I think that we must use medications related to reflex sympathetic dis dystrophy. Uh, how do you manage that in terms of medication? I think this is a wise, a very nice question. Well, you know, I think that medication, psychiatric medication uh, generally is not used by us, by, by yes. orthopedic 
surgeon. So I think we need a team approach to this. And uh, there is another very important point that I, I have read, you know, with very small letters, but Devayani was showing how empathic she is with patients and how is, uh, you know, she's in the same side of the patient. And uh, I, can, I have uh, feel that from her uh, lecture. And I think that is very important to be empathic besides medicines, you know, uh, we- To be human, to be human after all. Exactly. I think that is one important, you know, a, a very old, uh, he has already passed away, uh, orthopedic surgery professor, uh, used to say, uh, don't get me wrong, he used to say, you need to become the boyfriend of these old ladies. And yeah. it, that, I think that's a key point, you know, to make the patient feel that you understand what is going on through because yes. when we are we, when we are young professionals we are healthy and it's like the patients are another kind of tribe you know uh, are another kind of human beings because we don't feel anything we have not gone through those feelings so they are different from us and life show you when you suffer different situations or people close to you suffer those situations, these experiences make you wise. And you know that uh, what an impact these kind of situations have on patients. And we must be very empathetic and, and Devayani has shown that she is very empathetic with her patients. This is the, well, maybe allow me to say maybe this is the best antidepressant that, that the patient may have. In spite of uh, fluoxetine, sertraline, blah, 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 this is a very good thing because uh, we have, uh, I'm not gonna be vague even because of time, but we have to be, I learned that with much older doctors, they are all plus 70, 70 now. We, we are humans after all, they always tell me this. So you must have a technical, but a human approach is going side by side. You take his hand on a metaphorical, but a practical aspect, and you say, you, I am with you. And, and I guess that this has a, a very important impact because we don't, see, we do not treat shoulders or knees, we treat people. And a people is, a, 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 I would say, a, a conjunct of many things. I think that Dr. Uh, Daniel was very wise on mentioning this. So as we are two and a half hours, I'm gonna show my surgery uh, and I want Dr. Daniel to comment upon it because he has a lot of experience to come to our final con conclusions. I'm gonna share my screen now. This is a 10 minutes video, extremely pedagogical uh, here. There is a, 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 an audio, I don't have to say anything. I just want you guys to listen and that's it. Just a second. Yeah. Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Sergio Gravinsky orthopedic surgeon, shoulder and elbow surgeon from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in this video, I am presenting a case that represents a classical situation that now and then we may face in our daily shoulder practice, which is an atroscopic rotator cuff repair that evolves post-operatively to a hard and difficult to treat frozen shoulder scenario. As we all know, many arthroscopic cuff repairs, in fact, can develop some stiffness, and many do post-operatively. But the vast majority of these cases can be treated non-operatively. Anyway, some cases can be really harder to treat, and some of them may really end up with a permanent and definitive loss of glenohumeral motion and that is due 
to the development of adhesions in the glenohumeral capsule. So in this video, I am presenting a case of a 52-year-old lady who had a small and complete rotator cuff tear in her left shoulder and who was operated by me, Dr. Sergio Rovinsky, in 4 August 2016. We operated her and we fixed her small and complete supraspinatus cuff tear with an anchor in the greater tuberosity, obviously, and we still did we still did an intra-articular bicep stenodesis with an anchor in the lesser tuberosity, and we performed a classical subacromial decompression and acromioplasty. Yeah? So post-operatively, this patient evolved with a frozen shoulder scenario that was really hard to manage. And 18 months after that surgery, what means one and a half year after that surgery, the patient had gained almost full internal rotation and a reason a reasonable forward flexion in the left shoulder but nevertheless she also developed a considerable limitation of her external rotation on her left sh uh, shoulder in a way that she had nothing but zero degrees of external rotation in the left arm and in the left sh shoulder what was really bothering her and impeding her of doing her daily and usual activities. So when arthroscopic capsular re release was in, uh, indicated by me, and we did this surgery in 27 December 2017. And the intention here is she fundamentally didn't have external rotation was to do an anterior capsular release so this is the patient just before surgery in which we can see here that she had a reasonable elevation of the shoulder but the main problem of hers was the big lack of external rotation so as we have seen here she had zero degrees of external rotation now we are seeing this short video again and that's and that lack of external rotation was really really bothering the patient so now we are seeing it again so as we we examine her under anesthesia she had really no external rotation and that was bothering her too much so this is her surgery this is the left shoulder and we started uh, here trying to establish the anterior portal with a spinal needle. This is not easy in these cases because of all of the fibrotic tissue. But here we are using a standard spinal needle and then entering with an artery forceps uh, into the glenohumeral joint and opening the anterior capsule in order to be able to start the surgery with a soft tissue shaver. So now we start this, this surgery with a soft tissue shaver in the very anterior part of the anterior capsule. And just as we started the surgery, it was very easy for us to see and to identify the intra-articular long head of the biceps tenodesis that we had done 18 months before in the lesser with a metallic anchor in the lesser tuberosity of this left shoulder. So as we started the surgery, as we are seeing now pointed by the two yellow arrows, we are seeing here the suture that we use it in order to do the long head of the biceps tenodesis in the lesser tuberosity and once we had found it we would have nothing to do but obviously not to touch it and just continue with the surgery itself so here we are uh, with the shaver on the, the inferior part of the anterior capsule just above the subscap and it's not easy to start the surgery because of lack of space here we are debriding the synovitis on the very uh, anchor of the long head of the biceps from which we had done the tenotomy some uh, eight months before. And now this is a very important image 
And I think that uh, this is something that the orthopedic surgeon must really understand. So what are we seeing here in this photo? And I consider this photo a very pedagogical one. So what we are seeing here is in the very inferior part of the video, the upper part of the subscap, which is now being pointed by two yellow arrows. And on the upper part of the video, what we are seeing here is the anterior capsule, which was the pathological tissue in case in this very surgery. And removing it was the very intention of the surgical procedure. So what we did here was to create an, an entrance, a hole between the very inferior part of the thick and pathological anterior capsule and the very superior part of the upper subscapularis. So then we continued with the surgery, entering, entering here with an artery forceps to enlarge this hole, to make it larger and to make the entrance of other instruments easier. Here we are using again, a straight artery forceps, not a curved one. And the next instrument we use it, so it was an electrocautery device, just to diminish the super thick anterior capsule. This is what we are doing now. And just after that, we entered with a very important instrument in this kind of surgery, which is the arthroscopic scissor. So with an arthroscopic scissor, we are now cutting from inferior to superior, the very thick and altered anterior capsule until we started to see all the anterior deltoid muscle belly again. So now we are uh, doing it from inferior to su uh, superior. And now we are using the shaver just to enlarge all of, all of this removal that we started to do with electrical teddy and the arthroscopic scissor. Now uh, we are doing something that I consider very important, which is to uh, cauterize every very bleeding artery on the, on the region because we don't want much bleeding here in order to avoid the creation of new fibrotic tissue and hence new adherences in this shoulder. So here we are cauterizing the anterior labrum and this is again an image that I, Dr. Sergio Rovinsky, consider very pedagogical. And this is why I am, um, I am showing this photo to you uh, in this video. So now we are seeing a photo here, which I consider very important. And we must understand uh, in terms of arthroscopy, which are the anatomical structures that we have seen here in this very image. So on the, on the left part of, the, of this image of this photo, we are seeing the very medial part of the humeral head. Uh, on the very inferior part of this photo, what we are seeing is the upper part of the subscap, considering that the insertion is on the left part of the photo, in, uh, where the subscap is inserting in the humeral head. On the right side of this photo, what we are seeing here is the, is the anterior labrum and just uh, and just uh, uh, in continuity with it, it is the articular part of the glenoid, of course. And when we look to the front, we see an U-shaped image. And what is this? So this U-shaped image corresponds fundamentally to the removal of the alterate, fake, and pathological anterior capsule. And this is fundamentally what this surgery is about. And so who is this uh, uh, red structure that we are seeing here with all of these, these arrows? This is the muscle belly of the anterior deltoid. And we were not seeing it because we had so much pathological 
tissue that we remove it. And again, this is what the surgery is about. So continuing with the surgery now, we enter it with the shaver to remove all of the adherences between the subscap and the inferior part of the glenoid. This is what we are doing now. It's very important not to create an iatrogenic albancart lesion. Okay, we must not cut the anteroinferior glenohumeral ligament, but just remove, as we are doing here, all the adherences between the glenoid and the uh, subscap. And now we are seeing here basically uh, the upper part of the subscap. And here the surgery has gained, the, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the patient has gained full range of, of motion. Again, full external rotation. We are internally and externally rotating the, sh the, the, the shoulder and the, the motion was back again. Finally, we decided to do some ablation of the superior fibers of the subscap because we think that this is worth doing. We do ablation of the superior fibers of the subscap in low temperature because we don't want the subscap to develop because of this fraying any kind of tear in the future. So now we are just ablating the subscap, the superior part of the upper third of the subscap. We are basically finishing it now. It's finished and this is the final view in which we can see the ablation of the subscap and the remover the removal of all the anterior capsule and at this moment the surgery was then finished. So this is the final result in the very end of this, this surgery the patient had gained full external rotation again this is what she really needed and not only her external rotation was fully recovered but in the very end of the surgery, her forward elevation was quite better. And at that moment, the surgery was then finished. Okay. Daniel, your comments. Well, uh, very interesting, very clear. Uh, there are not common cases, but yes. sometimes it's necessary to do this kind of release. I would like to ask you which is your uh, protocol for postoperative uh, rehabilitation in these cases? This is a very impor important question because, see, this is the only surgery which is very uncommon in my practice in which I don't use a sling, no sling. And if I could, but I don't have structure here, I would use something I saw in the United States. It was a catheter that the anesthetist puts and it keeps for one week putting, uh, I would say, uh, uh, some kinds of anesthetic for the patient do it in home. In the United States, it's not, it's not uncommon. But what I do is to give a lot of analgesics Physio in the very next day, I have an arrangement with the is It's a very uncommon procedure, but physio in the very next day. I have done seven cases in my life, eight max in 15 years. But what I can tell you is that, is that these patients, they disappear from the office very fast because they have suffered it so much. They get better so fastly. Uh, there is a, a, an an Indian, maybe you know him, Bijayendra Singh. He's a lovely Indian shoulder guy. He, well, you, you, you know him. He lives mm -hmm. in UK and he calls it happy surgery. Very uncommon, but happy surgery. Uh, fast recovery, very uncommon, but it's a happy surgery. The patient says goodbye to you very fast because you see, he's seeing us in the office because he's suffering too much. And when suffering stops, uh, he has a tendency in the orthopedic office to disappear. So you see, it's not difficult. I think that what is difficult to me, listen to me, is the emotional process inside my mind to see that everything is failing. 
and I am coming to the moment in which I will have to indicate a surgery. And in spite of being a surgery that is not difficult technically to me, it pains in my heart to come to this moment. Maybe I will have to change, but it happens every three years. So, but what I want uh, you guys to show is that I did what Dr. Daniel said. I not only took the anterior interval, but I released the inferior capsule. Dr. Daniel mentioned that. And another thing, there is a, a, something that is related in literature, which is to do a non-intentional but iatrogenical bank tear. So this patient is going to be happy. And after 10 days, he's going to have an anterior dislocation. I'm going to shoot myself and the patient is going to get crazy. So we don't, so it's very important. Release the adherences between the, uh, the posterior border of the subscap, glenoid, take care with the, uh, inf the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. Daniel, I guess you, you, you would say exactly the same. Oh, you mentioned yes. that in your lecture. Yes, huh? I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Okay, lovely. So see, uh, we are almost three hours. Um, it was a very nice event. I would like to discuss more things, but we all have patience to see. Uh, it was very nice. Uh, I am honored, flattered. It's a never ending discussion. Uh, yeah, Daniel, it's a never ending, but yeah. I am very happy. I have the honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to pick up in, a, in, in next days this event as I have been doing from the YouTube of Orto TV to put in my YouTube channel with the, I have been doing this. So uh, everybody, we, we will be able to see this in Orto TV's platforms and in my YouTube channel. Uh, I, I am very happy to have the chance to do it. I just wanna mention that in January, we will do uh, an, a next Indo-Brazilian meeting on scapular fractures with very good guys from Brazil. I'm picking another one, probably probably Dr. Parag Shah. I have already discussed it with Niraj. I'm gonna invite him. Much probably he will say yes. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here, I just want to listen to your final speeches before uh, Devayani, Juan, and Dr. Daniel, which is not the last time you are here, Daniel. I'm going to invite you again. You are so important. And then Dr. Ashok can say his final words. Devayani, ladies first. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sergio. The microphone, the microphone, the microphone. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sergio and Author TV, Shoulder Planet, and all the panelists here. It was a lot of information for me as well. Uh, I, I really loved the session. It was a great opportunity, and I would love to be like uh, I love to listen to all of you day long, long, long. Thank you so much for yes, this opportunity. Too. Yeah, I would love to keep for five hours, but we don't have this time. I understand. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Juan, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a honor. I'm speaking in Spanish with him. Uh, and your final words, it was an honor, sir. Uh, if you want to say anything, please do. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to share with you, all of you, this, this webinar. I learned a lot, and I hope these webinars have a continuous uh, way for teaching uh, to every world. Um, thank you so much. It was lovely for myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Daniel, please. Well, uh, as I said, it was a very challenging topic and a great team. Yeah, like I enjoyed this very much. I think we should keep on uh, using this team uh, to to you know, for different topics, because uh, we have seen the same problem from different points of view. And I think that everything was very complementary. It, it matched very well. So yeah. uh, I think we could keep on working on this way. 
Uh, just to thank you, to thank Auto TV guys, uh, Ashok, who has been here, and um, waiting for the next one. Really yes, it. yes, it's an honor, it's a privilege. Uh, we will keep on talking, and uh, I have been thinking about many webinars for next year. I just want to mention, and I guess that Dr. Ashok will comment upon, I have the honor. Uh, to be involved in Orto TV Brazil, which is it's going to be Orto TV Brazil to South America. Uh, I know because I have already spoken with Dr. Daniel, which knows a lot of people in South America, that he's going to help me, help Dr. Ashok, and help us in Orto TV, which is going to be spoken in Spanish. I speak Spanish well because my mother is from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, and uh, so the thing is, we are going to do it, and I'm very happy that Orto TV is going into uh, Latin America. This is going to be a new opportunity, a new challenge for us. Dr. Daniel, thank, thank you for helping us, me and Dr. Ashok and Dr. Niraj, in this new Latin America project, which I hope is going to be a success. Thank you all. And we obviously we have to to listen to Dr. Ashok before we finish it. So, I mean, thanks to all faculty. This was an excellent, excellent webinar. And we started with basic concepts and then went ahead with advanced. You also saw surgical techniques and decision making. So it was a very, very comprehensive webinar on this very, very important and common topics that we all see in our clinical practice. So it's going to yeah. help a lot of people in, I'll say, years to come. So people will watch this and re-watch this and learn. And especially, I think, students will be learning a lot from this and also physiotherapists. So thanks, yeah. all faculty, for making this possible for us. And uh, like Dr. Sergio said, Ortho TV Brazil is a new opening. And soon we'll start going from Brazil to all other countries and we are looking for having individual country-wise ortho TV channels so that each country can pro can put up their content on the platform and can be viewed globally. So that's the aim and objective for doing it. And thank you, Dr. Sergio, Dr. Daniel, Dr. Zohan, and Dr. Devyani for helping us out. Thanks a lot. Okay, and we always have to, to end this. It's a classical with uh, namaste, <laughs> namaskar, yeah, namaste. namaste, and it's an honor. Uh, we will finish now and uh, see you guys in January. We will establish a date with Dr. Ashok next in the Brazilian scapular fractures, difficult cases, beautiful, uh, beautiful videos. We are already working on that. See you, Dani Avat. Dani Avat. <laughs>